are the main initiatives that PMI is undertaking to comply with regulations and contribute to reducing the impact of uh, tobacco-based products on public health? So um, I, I think there, there are a, a few things, but the important um, starting point for us, I think, is encapsulated by the point where we say, if you don't smoke, don't start. If you smoke, stop. But if you don't stop, then change. So in terms of uh, working towards creating a society that is uh, smoke-free, I think it's very important that we, we address the issues of, number one, of course, uh, uh, preventing people who don't smoke from beginning to smoke. And uh, I think you'll, you will find that if you look through our practices in our supply chain, um, in a number of areas, we take action to, to try to limit that as much as possible. Secondly, you'll see through our indirect retail channel, I think in 2022, something like 91% of uh, our total shipment volume uh, that, that, was, that was sold was sold through stores that have uh, youth access prevention programs in place. So uh, this, this is also very good. And then, you know, there, there are other measures as well, but the important area comes to where when we deal with people who smoke, because I think you've, you've, heard, a lot of, um, you, you've heard a lot today about, you know, there's this, there's this vast majority of smokers who either have no motivation to, to quit or what they call are unable or unwilling to quit. Uh, the second one is how do you believe effective partnerships can be established between the tobacco industry and governmental or non-governmental organization to address tobacco consumption issues in a sustainable and responsible manner? I think in, in any industry, um, an industry is not isolated. An industry has a number of, of different players, uh, a number of different role players. So whatever it is, you'll have regulators, you'll have civil society, you'll have the consumers of, of that product, you'll have other interested parties. And one of the ways to, to be able to work together in, in uh, a way that caters for the concerns of all these people is to have openness, is to have transparency, and I think partnership is built off that. There are issues, let's put those issues on the table. And you can do this if you're in the automobile industry, you can do this if you're in uh, the food industry, but unfortunately um, with, with the tobacco industry it tends to be a lot more difficult to actually have that openness and transparency. I get that we're uh, an industry that comes with a lot of baggage, but certainly you'll see that as far as being able to reduce smoking, um, we're, we're certainly walking the talk. Uh, we've invested more than $10 billion uh, over the last uh, 10 years or so to be able to, uh, not only into the research and development, but the commercialization of smoke-free products. We, we hear the feedback from consumers. We share our science with, uh, with governments, with uh, the scientific community, etc. So the, the, if I could say one thing more than anything else, you need to have transparency. And the second is that you need to be able to sit across the table and talk. That's correct. And the last one, many of the speakers mentioned countries like the UK, Sweden and Japan as best practices for reducing smoking rates. In your opinion, why doesn't the WHO FIS, uh, FIS to, uh, TC apply the lessons from these countries in their approach to tobacco control? Mm -hmm. Um, with Look, the, the WHO has responsibility for a number of countries uh, everywhere around the world. We understand that uh, a health body of that stature needs to be able to, um, it has to take into account real world evidence, has to take into account the scientific evidence. I, I can't answer for why they haven't looked at uh, the, the evidence there, um, but what, what I can say is that, you know, as a, a, a body that is is um, focused on creating policy and guideline for, uh, guidelines for, for global health, especially on an issue like this where you have more than a billion people around the world being affected by, uh, by, by, by smoking or, or million, uh, more than a billion smokers around the world. It's important that we, we don't lose sight of, of these countries. Uh, I think that not only are these countries best practices, they are, they are many others as well, whether um, they have um, particular kinds of products that enable people who, who don't quit to change to them, whether they have uh, regulations and taxation set up in such a way that they encourage people who don't quit to, to, to make better choices. These things exist and I think that uh, you asked a question earlier about partnership. Uh, not that we're trying to, to create partnership, but I do think with when it comes to, to the World Health Organization, there has to be 
uh, a level of transparency. Uh, we have to be able to debate the science, agree, disagree, 100%, that's fine, but importantly, you need to have more voices around the table um, so that you can have multidisciplinary inputs, you can have different opinions, and you can evaluate the full body of scientific evidence and not just a portion of it. What scientific evidence exists regarding the impact of reduced freeze products on uh, health compared to conventional tobacco products? Uh, we already have for, for a few years now preliminary evidence that the function of the arteries uh, improves immediately within four weeks of switching from, for example, uh, tobacco cigarettes to the studies that we've done. Um, and that makes sense because there is no combustion in these products. And um, of course, we don't have long term data, for example, to tell us what's the rate of heart attacks in people who use harm reduction products compared to those who smoke. It's still too early for that. But all the preliminary data that we have on risk factors or prognostic indicators for future disease uh, are showing that we have benefits which are very similar to quitting smoking without using anything. I wouldn't say that at the end they're going to be identical, but they are very similar and that's a, a very positive um, uh, uh, evidence uh, for the future and for hardcore epidemiological endpoints, which are heart attacks or in case of respiratory disease, chronic obstructive lung disease, and of course cancer, which is also a major problem with smoking. Thank you. And the last one is what are the main conclusions of your research regarding the use of other alternatives for smoking cessation? I think that, again, we have data today that they help people quit. Uh, I've done a lot of analysis of the Eurobarometer, for example, which is the biggest survey performed in the European Union. But there are also randomized control trials showing that they are better than nicotine replacement therapies, for example. And, of course, empirical evidence shows that they are particularly helpful, especially and even for people who never thought they would be able to quit, and for people who have not tried and do not want to try medications or have failed with medications, which means that they had no other option besides using these harm reduction products. So harm reduction and these products for smoking represent a supplementary and additional option for smokers who are unwilling or are unable to quit with currently approved methods. What strategies is PMI promoting to enhance understanding and support for alternatives to conventional tobacco products among decision makers and the general public? I think the probably the first role that our company has to play is to develop, assess, manufacture and commercialize better alternatives to cigarettes. So I would say that the most important role we have is to bring better products to the market for the consumers, to assess them. I believe we develop top-notch science and I think it's our role to put that science out there for, for example, regulators and uh, other experts to assess and uh, and, uh, and debate with us uh, about our uh, conclusions. I think that is probably our primary role in this respect. Yes. Uh, how do you see PMI's role in shaping and implementing public policies to promote harm reduction in relationship to tobacco consumption? I do believe that this top-notch science that I do believe we are uh, generating today on our products it is important that the decision makers and the public are informed. So I think that if you think about, um, if you think about um, uh, consumers today in Romania who are smoking, I think there's uh, probably more than 30% of the population in Romania is smoking today. So what do they need? I think they need a few elements. They need to be aware that these products exist, right? These products need to be acceptable as a substitute for smoking. These products need to be affordable and these products need to be accessible ideally for example in places where consumers uh, go and buy their uh, their cigarettes so in the same place i think these uh, new alternatives these smoke free products need to be available so i think that uh, that is very important and it is our obligation in my view to inform decision makers and the public that these products uh, exist and to advocate for policies that accelerate the demise, the decline of smoking, because these products can ultimately replace cigarettes. That's right. 
And the last one, uh, the scientific evidence shared by many of the speakers at this event seems to support adult smokers switching to alternative nicotine products at scale. Yet, the WHO um, FCTC claims the scientific evidence demonstrates the opposite. Why is this? Why do you think is this? I believe this is for one reason. When the WHO looks at these new products, they look at them in isolation. They look at them as if one billion smokers on this planet didn't exist in isolation. And I think that's the, probably the fundamental difference, that they don't look at these products as a competitor to cigarettes. They look at them as if they existed in the world where cigarettes don't exist. But that is just not reality, because in reality, as you know, in Romania and around the world, there are one billion smokers. And in that context, these products, of course, the existence of these products makes a lot of sense, because they can make smoking obsolete. What role do antioxidants in uh, reduced risk products play in protecting cellular health and the body against the oxidative stress? Uh, oxidative stress uh, is uh, just a general definition of uh, uh, some chemicals uh, which may react with uh, endogenous molecules and they are responsible for uh, development and progression of the disease. So uh, antioxidants are like scavenger, uh, they clean up our body from uh, these uh, chemicals so somehow they can uh, um, prevent uh, and also reduce the progression of the diseases which are related uh, to uh, free radicals formation, including aging, which is itself a disease. Thank you. And how can consumers identify reduced risk tobacco products and integrate them into a healthy lifestyle? Uh, so, uh, just uh, continuing to what uh, I just answered to your previous uh, question, uh, uh, cigarettes uh, contains uh, many uh, combustion products and many reactive uh, species uh, which are uh, responsible uh, for the development and the progression of disease. Uh, just think about lung cancer, uh, cardiovascular disease. Uh, so, the responsible of uh, the um, increase in such disease is the combustion products. When you use the tobacco heated products, of course they contain less combustion because there is no combustion there, of course, uh, and uh, that's why we call it them uh, term, arm reduced products and uh, they are associated to a um, significant reduction of the risk to develop this disease.